graph it. The teacher tells you this. You roll your eyes, your sweat drips down your brow, and perhaps you even give up. But don't be scared. A graph is just telling a story. That's all. That's all it really is. It's a visual way of telling a story. Not only that, but if you can read a graph, you can pass almost any standardized test that uses graphs. And if you know how to make the graphs, like after this video, then you'll know how to read the graphs. For example, as Willows, I don't know who that is, said in 2012 apparently, um, he says, behind every graph, there is a story waiting to be told. So not only can you tell a story out of a graph, but you can make a graph out of a story. Yeah, okay. See Star Wars. <laughs> Nerd. Ha. So see how the tension in the y-axis, that's the tension, y-axis, increases and decreases as time goes by, the x-axis. Time goes by with events in the story, right? So you start off with the rebels being captured. But then it calms down. So less tense. Then Luke's parents are killed. Hey, hey, no spoilers. Sorry. That, I didn't know 40 however many years was the problem here. Uh, but anyway, his parents getting killed is very intense. Uh, so, but then we switch to Han Solo, which is calmer. And then yada, yada, yada. Luke uses the Force to destroy the Death Star and save the galaxy. Then you have the special ceremony for heroism and excellent credit music sequence, and the story is done. Down here, we have a graph that kind of expresses how productive I am. Somebody else made this up, uh, and it shows in a somewhat funny fashion how I'm not productive at first because I have too many distractions. Then I reach peak pr productivity around 2 a.m., and then I get much too tired after that. So here's another one that's a little more direct. This graph has the height of a person on the y-axis and the weight of a person on the x-axis. And each point represents a person. And it's placed on the graph based on their height and weight. The story behind this is the relationship it shows between height and weight. Do you see a trend? I'm looking. Look really hard. Keep looking. I'm looking. Ah, there it is. The trend is basically that the taller someone is on average, the heavier that person will be on average. So again, all we're really doing is telling a story in a single, simple graphic. Ah, but there's a second thing that a graph does, and that's showing relationships. Between what? Well, whatever is on the x-axis and whatever is on the y-axis. More often than not, this is the relationship between the independent variable and the dependent variable. Let's try one out uh, to get acquainted with the process. Okay, fine. So here we have some data to graph. Okay? The blue column is the pressure that it took to break a sample of concrete. The yellow column is how many days between when the concrete sample was poured and when we broke the sample. You might already notice a trend that the pressure to break the sample increases as the days increase uh, as well. But there's more. We have to make a graph of this oh, data. Oh, really? Uh, all right, fine. What's step one? Okay, so step one. What do we do? Draw the axes. You made a whole step just for this? Yes. You'd be surprised how many simple things need to have a specific step. But anyway, yes, we draw axes. And what you do is you have your x-axis, which goes lefty-righty, and your y-axis, which goes upy-downy. Straight lines, perpendicular, right there. So what next? Aha! You label your axes. How? How do we label the axes? Well, in this class, you always put your independent variable on the x-axis. That's most of the time what people do in science, but there are exceptions. But in this class, always the independent variable on the x-axis. Remember, the independent variable is the thing that you are consciously changing. And since we are consciously changing when we break the sample, we can write days after pour on the x-axis. Now, obviously, that means that pressure is going to be on the y-axis. But 
Why? Get it? Because we always put the dependent variable on the y axis. This way the graph shows whether the pressure goes up or down as the days after the pour increases. So I can draw some lines now, right? No. We have to make the number scales first. There's a very key point here that you need to space the numbers evenly. The numbers evenly and not the data. Let me explain. Here's some data. Doesn't matter what it is. Just notice that the X numbers go up by one every single time. Whereas the blue numbers go up more and more each time. See how they increase more and more each time? Now, here's the right way to do this. See how the numbers for the Y axis start at zero and go all the way up to 512? Well, now let's pick, let's pick an easily divisible number to put at the top of the graph, like 600. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm going to divide the numbers on the scale up easily. If you do this, you get the proper data and you would get this. Notice the 600 and the zero. Notice how it's evenly spaced. Each little line here is worth 150. 150 plus 150 is 300, plus 150 is 450, plus 150 is 600, okay? That's the basic idea there. Oh, so you get a real representation of what happened. That's right. Now, what's the wrong way to do this? The wrong way. Well, if you put the data directly on the graph, going up one block for every piece of data. Yeah, that's what I usually do. Do you see the issue? See, this space right here is worth one. But as you get higher up in the graph, it's worth more than one. Here it's worth, well, what's 32 minus 16? That's 16. That same space is now worth 16. That is not consistent. And if you just transfer the data to the axis, no matter what, even if it goes down, no matter what, you will always get this relationship. If it's not consistent, you get the same line every single time. All right, I guess I'll just divide the range of numbers up instead of just throwing the data up there. Awesome. Okay, so back to our data. I noticed that our days after the pour uh, goes from uh, 1 to 28. So, since 1 is very close to 0, especially compared to 28, let's just start at 0 and let's end at 32. Uh, 32? Um, why 32? That's not a data point. Yes, you are correct that 32 is not a data point. However, 32 does divide very nicely in halves, quarters, and eighths. Uh, let me show you. So if you put a dash uh, right in the middle, that turns out to be 16. That's 32 divided by 2, 16. And then if you put dashes in the middle of the other two, voila, you've got 8 and 24. And if you mark halfway between the rest of the divisions, you get the numbers that go up by fours. It's a nice, easy way to make this scale perfect. Now on the y-axis, the pressure goes from 100 to 450. Now again, compared to 450, 100 is pretty close to zero. So I'll start at zero. I'm going to visually estimate and just go up by a hundreds. Okay. So 0, 100, 200, 300, 400, and 500. Now I did make sure that these lines are all exactly the same space apart. They have to be if they're each going to be worth 100. But we'll go over more about this later in the packet. There's a better way to do that. Ah, great. Finally, we can draw some lines. Not quite. We're close, but we're, uh, we're missing something that I will take points off for every single time. Units again? That's right. Units. Here's the thing. Uh, both axes need units. Now, the x-axis is already taken care of with days after the pour. Days would be the units. But pressure needs units. And if we look up at the actual data table, it says pressure in PSI. So, PSI. Perfect. That stands for pounds per square inch. And now it is time to 
plot the points. Ah, oh, finally. Now, I'm not going to go into detail here, but essentially you take each data point, each combination of X and Y, like 1, 100, 2, 150. As an ordered pair, you go over however far X tells you, and then up as high as Y tells you, and then you draw the dot for each data point. Then you can either connect the dots or do the line of best fit. Here we have the dots on there. Now, should we do a line of best fit or should we do a connect the dots? Here's the tip. If you're graphing the motion of one object or the change of a characteristic of one thing, then connect the dots. But if you're taking on multiple samples, say of concrete or people's height and weight, that's when you do a scatter plot and you do the line of best fit. And that's what we have up here. So we're done now, right? Right. So close. Not yet, dude. You need a title. Now, the title is not, not, not just Days After the Poor versus Pressure, okay? Nothing as obvious like that. What you're doing when you do that is you are essentially insulting the reader because they can read the X and Y axes. They don't need you to tell them what they are. So here's what you do. The reader can read, so let's give them context, okay? context, such as what you were testing, and include the independent and dependent variable. For example, curing of concrete over one month's time. Why is this a good title? Because it gives the idea of the experiment, because we're testing the curing of concrete, uh, and it includes the independent and dependent variable. The independent being the days after the pour, or how long it's been cured, and the dependent being how cured the concrete is. So you've got a nice context, give them a little explanation of the lab, and the independent and dependent variable. So we're done now, right? Right? Okay, yes, you're done. But just remember, what does a good graph look like? You got three things. One, all the data fits on the graph. Number two, you're not wasting any space. There's not much white space on there. And three, the scale must be evenly distributed. So now you know how to make graphs. You also know how to read graphs. Now it's time to actually use them and create them in class. I will see you later.